Good morning everyone, uh, this is Max, and today I want to talk about the mountain yellow-legged frog, a really cool species of amphibian that lives up here in the Sierra Nevada, and the conservation issues that it has been going through. So to learn more, let's get started. <laughs> So the frogs I'm talking about today are the mountain yellow-legged frogs, which are found in alpine and subalpine lakes, ponds, and creeks throughout the Sierra Nevada mountains, the San Gabriel mountains, and the San Bernardino mountains. Um, there are actually two species of this kind of frog. Um, one is the Sierra Nevada yellow-legged frog, which is found throughout most of the Sierra Nevada. Um, the other one is the Southern California yellow-legged frog, and this one is found in the San Gabriel and San Bernardino Mountains of Southern California, as well as the Southern Sierra Nevada. So for this video, I'm going to talk mostly just about the frogs that live in the Sierra Nevada, but I'm going to be talking about both species. Uh, the differences between the two species um, don't really show themselves very easily. Um, if you're just looking at them and comparing them visually, uh, it's mostly a genetic difference. Um, so I'm just going to be calling them all mountain yellow-legged frogs. So living at a high elevation and living in the mountains, um, these frogs live in very cold and harsh conditions a lot of times. So um, this is especially the case for high alpine lakes and ponds, but it also uh, is true for creeks. Um, if you think about it, the mountains are a cold place. Uh, for six months of the year, it's basically winter time and uh, you get a lot of snow. So the creeks and ponds and lakes can all be like covered over in ice and snow. Even uh, during the summer, it is really cold here. Um, and like during the day, if there's sunlight and you're out there in the exposed areas, it can be warm. Uh, but in general, like if you were to go in the water, it's still really cold. And at nighttime in the summer, it is also really cold. So this uh, environment up here in the Sierra Nevada is not the sort of place that you would really expect um, a cold-blooded or ectothermic organism uh, to be hanging out because they rely on the environment to keep their body temperatures warm. And so in a cold environment, it's kind of, it's a lot harder to do that. So how do these frogs survive up here in this environment? Well, in short, these frogs are just really unusual for frogs. They are very different from other frogs in a lot of different ways. And uh, one of the ways in which that becomes obvious is in how they warm up and keep their bodies warm. So um, one of the ways in which they do this is they uh, move around to different parts of uh, the water sources where they live in order to keep their uh, body temperatures warm. So in general, it depends on the site, but um, the water temperatures um, where these frogs live can be anywhere from 40 degrees Fahrenheit to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. At the high end, that seems more reasonable, but at the low end, that's pretty cold. Um, and there are some areas uh, in those places where the temperature may be a little higher, like maybe it's just shallow water um, or there's a different substrate underneath the water. Um, but anyway, the frogs will spend a lot of time in those warmer areas and they will, by doing that, increase their body temperature. If their body temperature ever for some reason did get too high, they'd just go to the colder areas. By moving around the water at different temperatures, um, the frogs are able to keep their body temperatures significantly higher than it would be if they didn't do that. Another way that they increase their body temperature is also by basking in the sun. Uh, you'll often find these frogs on rocks, logs, or even just the plain ground um, during the day. Um, and that's because they're basking. They're trying to get the sun to warm them up. And uh, this is really unusual behavior for a frog. Um, most frogs would not be able to live very long if they were in direct uh, sunlight. Because if you think about it, um, frogs have semi-permeable skin that they have to keep moist. Um, and they use their skin to breathe. It's the main way that a lot of amphibians breathe and that is the same for frogs. And so if that skin is not moist, if it dries out, um, it can't be used to breathe, and so then amphibians can basically just desiccate, suffocate, and die. Um, so most amphibians aren't active during the sunny times of day because they don't want to have their skin dry out. But these frogs seem to do it uh, and live just fine. 
Um, if their skin ever did dry out for some reason, they can always hop into water um, because they're almost never more than three hops away from water. And all of the places where they do live have water all year round. Another thing that's really weird about these frogs is that their lifespans and life cycles are a bit distorted compared to other frogs. Um, so for the adults, um, at some of the sites up here, we can find 15 year old frogs, um, which does not sound that old, but 15 is pretty old for a frog. So in short, um, the lifespans of these frogs are increased. And this is partially because of the very short growing season out here in the Sierra Nevada. Depending on how uh, cold and snowy it is in a given year, there may be as little as just three months of the year where these frogs are able to breed, feed, um, and grow. And so as a result, they generally live a lot longer than other frogs. The tadpoles also have their life cycle kind of distorted. Um, whereas most frog tadpoles would only stay in the tadpole stage for part of the year, um, these tadpoles stay in the tadpole stage for two to three years before they metamorphosize into a juvenile frog. And as a result, um, they also get a lot bigger than other tadpoles of similar species of frogs. So that's just a brief overview of the life history of the mountain yellow-legged frog. But the main reason I wanted to talk about them today is because they have suffered massive population declines in recent decades. Um, so much so that they have been listed as an endangered species and have become a major focal point of amphibian conservation in the United States. So there's a few reasons why they have declined, um, but there's actually two main reasons that are the most worthy of blame. Um, so the first of these reasons is that starting in the 19th century, but definitely more so in the 20th century, the Department of Fish and Game introduced uh, non-native trout to the High Sierra Lakes. So before these non-native trout were introduced to the Sierra Nevada, there were fish in the Sierra Nevada. Um, in fact, the state of uh, freshwater fish of California, the golden trout, is found in the Sierra Nevada in creeks in like the southern portion of the mountains. Um, there were also a few other species of fish that were mostly found in streams, but there were also probably a few in lakes. Um, however, many streams and most of the high elevation lakes um, did not have native fish in them. And um, these were the places um, a lot of times that you would find mountain yellow-legged frogs. Um, and the reason for that, the reason why they had to be in places where there were no fish um, is because, like a lot of other frogs and amphibians that breed in the water and have tadpoles, um, the mountain yellow-legged frogs cannot survive with fish. Um, so fish are very effective predators of tadpoles, um, frog eggs, and juvenile frogs. And if you have a lot of big fish and a water source, Frogs just do not breed effectively in those waters. So that's why the frogs were in places where the fish were not. Um, but then the Department of Fish and Game introduced these non-native trout because people who wanted to go to the Sierra Nevada to recreate um, were unhappy that there weren't a lot of fish in the uh, lakes and streams. They wanted to go fishing, but there were no fish. And so the Department of Fish and Game introduced those fish so that people could recreate. Um, and the result was catastrophic for the frogs because many frog populations died out um, where the fish were introduced. So today, conservationists are trying to solve this issue by removing the non-native trout from a lot of lakes. In fact, there's a group uh, with the University of California and um, also there's groups with the National Park Service where um, they are going up to these remote lakes where the trout have been introduced and through a variety of methods, they're clearing out the trout um, so that the frogs can be uh, put back into those environments and the natural uh, equilibrium of those ecosystems can be restored. The second major issue that these frogs have faced is contact with a chytrid fungus. Um, so this is the scientific name of this chytrid fungus. Um, it is really hard to pronounce, and a lot of scientists just shorten it to BD. So that's what I'll be calling it uh, throughout the rest of this video. 
So researchers are still unsure about how this um, fungus originated. Uh, it was first discovered in the 1990s. What they do know is that this fungus developed relatively recently. So it's a new fungus. Um, frog populations around the world have not had the opportunity to um, evolve with this fungus and develop some sort of immunity to it. So many frog populations are at risk when this fungus reaches their uh, specific ecosystem. Um, researchers are also not entirely sure what this fungus does to the frogs that it infects, um, but evidence suggests that it attacks the skin and the circulatory system, and that if loads are big enough, where there's enough fungus on a particular frog, that frog will die. So when this uh, fungus reached uh, the Sierra Nevada, um, it pretty much across uh, the mountains caused massive population declines in the mountain yellow-legged frogs. Um, and there was a uh, real worry that like the species would just completely go extinct because of its interactions with uh, this fungus. Um, however, on a more positive note, um, the frogs did not go extinct. Um, they are still around today, and um, in many areas, populations just seem to be persisting with this fungus. Even though it's been detected uh, around their populations, they have been um, surviving with it, and it has not been bothering them. That being said, some populations are still declining today, and there are definitely populations out here in the Sierra Nevada that do not have immunity to this fungus. So BD is definitely still a major threat to the mountain yellow-legged frog here in the Sierra Nevada. So researchers and conservationists are doing a lot to try and counteract uh, the effects of uh, BD on these frogs. So one of the main things that researchers are doing is trying to get a better idea of how this fungus um, affects um, these frogs and how different populations respond to the fungus. And that's where I come in. So you may have been wondering why I've been out here in the Sierra Nevada all summer long. And uh, the answer is I have been helping out with field work that the Briggs Lab at the University of California, Santa Barbara is conducting in the Sierra Nevada, um, which focus mostly on the Sierra Nevada yellow-legged frog and BD. Um, we are out here with a graduate student um, where this is their PhD project, and they are trying to figure out uh, the genetics of different populations of BD and uh, frogs throughout the Sierra Nevada, and trying to figure out um, how different populations respond to this fungus, if there's different uh, um, loads of fungus in different populations, and um, what specific genes may give the frogs immunity. Is immunity even a thing that the frogs are evolving in order to survive in places where they are persisting with this fungus? So what we do when we go out to conduct field work is we go and capture uh, 10 frogs from each site and we uh, take uh, genetic and skin samples uh, from these frogs to get an idea of their genes as well as um, the genetics and uh, loads of uh, BD, the chytrid fungus, that are on these frogs. And then we send these samples back to the lab at the University of California, Santa Barbara, um, where a graduate student will analyze them and then uh, interpret the results from there. Another thing that researchers and conservationists are doing um, to help these frogs out is they are on an annual basis surveying all the populations uh, where these frogs are located at. And um, they count all the tadpoles, juveniles, um, and adults that they find and get an overall sense of population size. And uh, by doing this for um, several years on end, so they're able to get an idea of whether populations are declining, whether they're rising, what their uh, ideal population size is and what it should be. Um, and then by doing that, they're able to detect if a population has a sudden and unpredicted decline, in which case they know that something may be happening with BD in that population, and then they need to act and make instant conservation decisions. Um, these population surveys are conducted by people working under the umbrella of the University of California in conjunction with the National Park Service and the National Forest Service. 
Another type of organization that's making a huge difference for these conservation issues are zoos and aquariums. Uh, both the Oakland Zoo and the San Francisco Zoo have breeding programs for the mountain yellow-legged frogs. Uh, they have helped out with lots of translocation and reintroduction events uh, for uh, frogs um, in the Sierra Nevada. Um, the Los Angeles Zoo also does a lot of work with mountain yellow-legged frogs. Um, their work is mostly concerned with those in the San Gabriel and San Bernardino Mountains of Southern California. Um, together, all of these conservation efforts are helping to make it where um, these frogs are getting a lot of support and um, they're generally in a very stable position. It is true populations are declining and the uh, species definitely is worthy of the endangered species uh, status. Um, but overall, these frogs have a lot of support which is helping them to uh, maintain their existence in the Sierra Nevada. And in a lot of areas, they are recovering. Like populations have been increasing um, where trout have been removed and frogs have been introduced, a lot of times those populations seem to be doing well. And if we uh, keep having all of this conservation and research work on these frogs and uh, making sure that that work is funded, um, these frogs stand a really good chance of uh, surviving into the future. So that's going to wrap it up for this video. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Um, I hope you got something out of this and I uh, showed you just how wonderful these frogs are and gave you an appreciation for them and their role in the Sierra Nevada ecosystem. Uh, if you like this video, be sure to give it a like and also recommend it to other people and to subscribe to my channel if you want to see more videos on ecological concepts and uh, my wildlife watching experiences. Um, so thank you again so much for watching and I will see you in the next video.